Before we start the sermon, I would like to ask you to bow your heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we heard in our scripture reading as Jesus reminded us that without him, we can do nothing. Lord, I cannot deliver this sermon without Jesus, and your people cannot hear this sermon without Jesus. And therefore, we ask <clears throat> that you will come, touch us, Open our hearts, open our ears, and Lord, touch my lips, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you remember the sermon that our pastor preached last week? I see all of you can say yes. What was it about? Yes, it was about the necessity of change in our lives. I think that was about the third sermon he preached on that topic, and, and I certainly needed it. Uh, I think God spoke to me last week about the necessity of change in my life. And I asked him, Lord, help me now to bring a message as to how we are going to change. How can we change? Do you know who Mr. Dressup is? You don't because you're not Canadians. <laughs> Mr. Dressup was the name of a Canadian children's television series which was produced by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation from 1967 to 1996. That's almost 30 years. The series starred Ernie Coombs as Mr. Dressup. Ernie Coombs. Ernie Coombs was an American born in Maine. He became a Canadian citizen in 1994, two years before the end of his series. So he was there a long, long time working as a Canadian. The show aimed, uh, aired every weekday morning, every day. Each day, Mr. Dressup would lead children through a series of songs and stories, and arts and crafts, and imagination games. It was a wonderful thing for Canada. I wish we had more of the Ernie Coombses here in America on television for our children. Ernie Coombs was a, uh, presented with the Earl Grey Award, which honors excellence in Canadian television. He was a spokesman for the Canadian Save the Children organization and received an award from them in 1997. In 1996, he became a member of the Order of Canada. The Order of Canada is presented to a limited number of Canadians who exemplify the highest qualities of citizenship and whose contributions enrich the lives of their contemporaries. And he certainly did that. Think of it, 30 years, how many children were influenced by Mr. Dressup? He himself had three children, two sons and a daughter, and several grandchildren. Ernie Coombs lost his wife in 1992. I remember I was there in Toronto when it happened. It was a freak accident. They were uh, eating in a restaurant, and a vehicle came by accident and crashed through the plate glass and killed his wife. Ernie Coombs died at the age of 73 from a stroke, September 18, 2001. Now, few people know these facts about Mr. Dressup. Not too many people. Even in Canada, somehow the next generation forgets. But what they do know about him, he was a friend of children. It's not a bad way to be remembered, is it? A 
friend of children. All right, with that introduction, now the sermon. Strange how many gimmicks in our lives come and go. Wonder if you will recognize some of these. What was that? Oh, you all know it, hula hoop. You tried it, did you? Do you see any of those around today? Well, they're kind of coming back, are they? Yes. How many of you remember that? What is it? A top. Wooden spinning top with a string. How many of you boys or men used to throw that top and spin? Could you do it? Were you able to pick it up between your fingers and then on the palm of your hand, throw it up and down and it keeps spinning? Yeah, that's what we boys did. But somehow that has disappeared now. I wish our children could still have the joy of playing with a top. Remember this one? <laughs> this one is still around. I remember when it came out in South Africa, I was just a boy. It was so popular, every single household had at least two or three jigsaw puzzles. In my home, we were poor, but we had jigsaws, not because we were able to, to buy them, but we had a large family and richer people, and they would, as soon as they finished with them, they would hand them down to us. Problem was, sometimes these jigsaw puzzles caused great frustration. I think frustration is a jigsaw puzzle with several pieces missing. Even worse, sometimes it came and there were pieces mixed in from other puzzles. Now that is a problem. You know, sometimes I think the Gospel of Luke is like a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces. Have you ever thought that? Why do I say that? Luke is such a wonderful Gospel. Don't think that I'm saying anything negative about Luke. I love the book of Luke. Luke is the only Gospel that will give us the story of the prodigal son. Did you know that? Chapter 15. Several other things that Luke only has. Luke is the only gospel that gives us the story of the unjust judge in chapter 18. And then in chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, we have the story of the praying publican and the bragging Pharisee. You won't find that anywhere else in the Bible, only in Luke. So I'm very grateful for the gospel of Luke. But then chapter 16. Chapter 16, the problem chapter. Here we find two stories that has given me some headaches and heartaches. Verses 19 to 31, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Have you ever wor worried and wondered about that story? When I used to have to give Bible studies and it comes to the state of the dead, and then they'll say, wait a minute. I mean, Lazarus went straight to heaven? No, he didn't. He went to the bosom of Abram. Oh, that's just a figure of speech, you see. Sometimes I've said to myself, Lord, why did you have to tell that story? I mean, I could have left that one out. Until at last I understood the story, but still it's a problem because the people that you work with they don't get it. They don't know that the central point was not the state of the dead. Very hard not to crack. But Luke 16 verses 1 to 9 is the story that has given me the most headaches. Oh my, let's read it. Luke 16, 1 to 9, he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And 
An accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and he said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him. And he said to the first, How much do I, you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light and i say to you make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home Can you see the problem? Let's consider some of these problems. The master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Isn't that a problem? Would you commend your child if he did what that steward did? Is it ethical? Is it right to commend someone for doing what is wrong? Well, that bothered me so much. At least I came to the conclusion that that wasn't Jesus commending him. Jesus was just telling the story. It was the master of this steward that commended him. And Jesus was going to use that as a lesson. So it wasn't the words of Jesus, the actual recommendation. But... The last sentence of verse 8 presents a bigger problem. <clears throat> For, let's see. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. What does it mean in their generation? In their generation, if they are, wise, they are wiser or more shrewd in relation to people of their own kind, to people of this world. Uh, I think I've lost track of my... Let's see if I can go back. Yes. They are wiser amongst themselves is what Jesus was saying. But verse 9 is far more problematic. Look at verse 9. And I say to you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now that was the King James that's a problem for me. Make for yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. What is the mammon of unrighteousness? Dictionary says that the uh, mammon is wealth, the god of riches. Make for yourself. The new King James, I thought, would be a little clearer, but it wasn't really. It says, and I say to you, make friends for yourself by. Previous one said, make friends of the mammon. Now this says, make friends by the mammon. Little clearer, but do you quite understand it yet? When you fail, they may receive you into everlasting 
an everlasting home. Mammon is the riches, the wealth of the god Mammon. Ellen White must have seen this problem because she quotes the revised version when she talks about it. She says, Christ did not commend the unjust steward, but he made use of a well-known occurrence to illustrate the lesson he desired to teach. Make to yourselves, friends, by means of the mammon of unrighteousness. Did you see that? She's quoting not the King James. She didn't have the new King James in those days, but she's quoting the revised version. That's not the revised standard version. That was before the revised standard version. Because it makes it clear. Make to yourselves, friends, by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, he said, that when it, what's the it? The riches shall fail. They may receive you into the eternal tabernacles. Well, who's the they? Still a fr problem, isn't it? Let's read the New International Version. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it, and I added the money, it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now that was the clearest of all of them so far. Tell me, who are the friends? Who are the friends that you're making? What is the message that Jesus was trying to convey? He was saying, be faithful. Be faithful with what God has entrusted to you, for you are a steward. You, a child of light, should be as wise in your sphere as the wicked are in their sphere. How? How do we do it? He was saying, use whatever God has entrusted to you in such a way that you will be making friends who have the ability to welcome you into an eternal home. Well, where's the eternal home? That's obvious. That's heaven. Who in heaven has the ability to welcome you, for that matter, or to turn you away? Only God and his son Jesus. So Jesus is saying that we have been unfaithful stewards with the money and the means that we were supposed to have managed. But now we will have to be as wise or shrewd as the steward in the parable. We will have to use whatever we have left in such a way that we will make friends with those that can provide an eternal dwelling for us. And who are those friends again? Jesus and his Father. So we've got to use what we have in such a way that we make friends in heaven. That's what that text says. Now let's measure ourselves. Because Jesus said in that parable, speaking to his disciples and indirectly speaking to us, that we are the unfaithful steward. Are we? Is Jesus a little hard on us? Perhaps you say to yourself, I haven't really stolen and I haven't told anyone else to, to, to tell a lie about what they owe the Lord. Let's, let's measure ourselves by the standards that Jesus gave. Luke chapter 12, 16 to 22, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? since I have no room to store my crops. And so he said, I will do this. 
I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be many. Be merry. So what is wrong about having barns, putting your surplus stuff in there? Any of you have a storage shed outside? Do you have some goodies in there? <laughs> you feel the need to build a second one? Is it wrong to have certificates of deposit, CDs, where you store your surplus money? Is it wrong to have money market accounts? What about investing your surplus money in the stock market? Isn't that the same as a farmer building extra barns to put his extra wheat in? Listen. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So, he who lay, so is he who lays treasure up for himself and is not rich towards God. Rich towards God. What is Jesus' concept of being rich towards God? Let's measure ourselves with the measure that Jesus gives. Let's read on. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn. And God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom." Why does Jesus say all this to his disciples and to us? I'll tell you why. Because he is preparing them for what he is going to say next. Here is the punchline. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approach nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Have we been unfaithful stewards? Measure yourself. I measure myself by what Jesus says. We have to. Which of us have done this? Which of us? See what James, the brother of Jesus, says. James 4. You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. How often have we read that text to other people? Adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know what that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James, are you not being a little hard on us? Spending on our pleasures? 
spending on our pleasure is friendship with the world, enmity with God. Jesus says we are supposed to use our worldly wealth to gain friends in heaven who will allow us to come into heaven. Let's be honest with ourselves this morning, brothers and sisters. How do we spend our money? How do we spend it? Have we ever spent our money, the money that God has entrusted to us on our own pleasures? What did you buy last Christmas? How about that luxury car? <clears throat> uh, don't need that old Toyota anymore. I think I'll buy myself a Mercedes-Benz now. Did you really need that big screen, high definition television? Did you really need that extra computer? Well, computers go out of date, maybe we do. How about that snowmobile? What about that pleasure boat? Oh, well, we have to have recreation, you know. Uh, why not get a top? <laughs> Spin a top <laughs> rather than a pleasure boat. How about that motorhome? The latest cell phone? How about that vacation home down in Florida? Or is yours down in California somewhere? Oh, wretched man that I am. We all fall short, don't we? We are unfaithful stewards in need of friends in heaven. You know, I think it was easier for me when Luke chapter 16, 16 was still a jigsaw puzzle. And I didn't understand it. We desperately need friends in heaven to welcome us into heaven. And therefore we have to use our resources in such a way that we'll make friends in heaven. John 15. Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if... Little word, little word, tremendous implications. You're my friends if you do whatever I command you. What a menacing word that if is. You're my friends if you do what I command you. And what does he command us to do? Let's measure ourselves by his standards, the commandments of Jesus. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. What does it mean to deny yourself? Deny yourself when you drive by Dairy Queen? which Linda and I did last night, yesterday. <laughs> Deny yourself. Potluck dinner? Do we? Love one another as I have loved you. <clears throat> How did he love us? Died for us. Look around, brothers and sisters. How many here are you willing to die for? We fall short, don't we? Turn the other cheek. She didn't greet me this morning the way she should have. We'll see about that now. Turn the other cheek. Go the second mile. We do, do we? <clears throat> Linda leaves home. She says, Sweetheart, you, you're not working this morning. And Sabbath's coming. Will you vacuum the home? 
second mile. Sure, and I'll also wash the dishes, and I'll also uh, do the, the laundry, and I'll also do the dusting. But I say it with sarcasm. <laughs> to go the second mile is not to, to say it, but to do it. Love your enemies. Pray for them. Do we? Forgive one another as God forgives us. These are commandments of Jesus. Do we really? And then this last one, which I don't even want to show you again. Sell what you have and give alms. Oh, brothers and sisters, it's a catch-22, isn't it? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. None of us have really done that. We are all unfaithful stewards in need of friends in heaven. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm going to share with you something from a a writer that I enjoy very much, C.S. Lewis. <clears throat> now, before any of you become a little critical and say, why does he quote these non-Adventist writers? I want to challenge you to go on the internet and punch in Ellen White's library. Will you do that? She had a tremendous library. I counted, I think it's around about 2,000 books that are mentioned there. And of those, I suspect almost half, maybe a third, are books by famous Christians, Protestants. Well, C.S. Lewis was also a Protestant, Christian. He was a man who loved the Lord. He didn't have all the truth that we have. Of course he didn't have the Sabbath truth. He didn't know about the state of the dead. He had a wrong concept about the soul. But did he love his Lord? Did he have an experience with his God? Can he teach us something in that area? I believe he can, and he does. So I'm going to share with you <clears throat> from his book, Mere Christianity, M-E-R-E, -E, mere Christianity, which means simply Christianity. How did he write this book? He was asked, it was soon after World War II, or actually it was during the last years of World War II. <clears throat> he was an Englishman. He was a professor at Cambridge and also at Oxford. He had a doctor's degree in English literature. He, had, he was an atheist, and then he had a tremendous conversion experience. And with his analytical mind, he started reasoning with his atheist friends and helped them to become Christians too. Then he was asked to do a series of lectures on radio to help college students who were steeped in evolution to see the truth of a God of creation, a God of love, a God who came to die for us. And Lewis then gave a series of talks where he so beautifully, so logically, so simply, and yet so profoundly explained the principles of Christianity. And then he wrote it down in this book, Mere Christianity. I recommend the book to you. It is really very, very good. From the chapter, let's see if I got it here, Mere Christianity by Lewis. And I'm reading here from the chapter, <clears throat> Let's Pretend. Now, by, by this stage, he's now into this, this section of Christianity where he's going to explain sanctification, how we grow in grace. Let's pretend. We begin to notice, <clears throat> besides our particular sinful acts, he is now going to concentrate on more than just the acts, 
the deeds that we do. Our sinfulness begin to be alarmed not only about what we do, but about what we are. This may sound rather difficult, so I will try to make it clear from my own case. When I come to my evening prayers and try to reckon up the sins of the day, nine times out of ten, the most obvious one is some sin against charity, love. I've sulked or snapped or sneered or snubbed or stormed. Can you relate to that? <clears throat> and the excuse that immediately sprang to my mind is that the provocation was so sudden and so unexpected. I was caught off my guard. I had no time to collect myself. Now that may be an extenuating circumstance as regards those particular acts. They would obviously be worse if they had been deliberately and premeditated. On the other hand, surely what a man does when he is taken off his guard is the best evidence of what sort of a man he is. Surely what pops out before the man has time to put on a disguise is the truth. If there are rats in a cellar, you're more likely to see them if you go in very suddenly. But the suddenness does not create the rats. It only prevents them from hiding. In the same way, the suddenness of the provocation does not make me an ill-tempered man. It only shows me what an ill-tempered man I am. The rats are always there in the cellar. But if you go in shouting and noisily, they will have taken cover before you switch on the light. Apparently, the rats of resentment and vindictiveness are always there in the cellar of my soul. Now, that cellar is out of reach of my conscious will. I can, to some extent, control my acts, but I have no direct control over my temperament. Is that cut off? No, you have it. It's cut off over there. <clears throat> and if, as I said before, what we are matters even more than what we do, if indeed what we do matters chiefly as evidence of what we are, then it follows that the change which I most need to undergo is a change that my own direct voluntary efforts cannot bring about. Lewis is saying that the real you, the real me, is revealed by sudden crises. The real you is not in conformity with God's laws. And my conclusion is that the real you, the real me, is not a friend of God. I wish we had time to read the entire chapter, but we don't. I'll try to give you a summary. Lewis starts out by telling an ancient tale, an ancient story about a very ugly man who was ashamed to show his face in public. And so he came up with a plan. He had a friend with a very handsome face. And so he persuaded his friend to have a mask made of his beautiful face. And then the ugly man started wearing the mask of his friend's face. Now it's just a tale, but the story goes on that for years he wore this mask day and night. He wouldn't take it off even to see his own face. When he had to wash his face, he would take it off and not look in the mirror. In fact, he removed all mirrors from his house. When he shaved, he shaved by feel and then he put the mask back on. Then one day he got very, very sick. He had to go to the hospital and the doctor had to remove the mask and the nurses had to come and wash and shave him. And then one day one of the nurses, after shaving him, took out the mirror and held it in front of his face. 
And to his amazement, he didn't see his ugly old face. He saw his face had been molded into the mask and he looked like his friend, the attractive, beautiful man. And then after Lewis had told this story, he goes on to say, every time we pray our Father, we are putting ourselves in the place of the Son of God. We are dressing up as Jesus. We are putting on the mask of Jesus. He writes, the very first words of the Lord's Prayer are our Father. Do you now see what those words mean? They mean, quite frankly, that you are putting yourself in the place of the Son of God. To put it bluntly, you are dressing up as Christ. In other words, you are pretending. Because, of course, the moment you realize what the words mean, you realize that you are not a Son of God. You are not a being like the Son of God, whose will and interests are at one with those of the Father. You are a bundle of self-centered fears and hopes, greeds, jealousies, and self-conceit, all doomed to death. In a way, then, this dressing up as Christ is a piece of outrageous cheek. English way of saying, hmm, bravado, I don't know what cheek is in, in American. But the odd thing is that God has ordered us to do it. As you dress up as Christ, certain things will begin to worry you. My brothers and sisters, when you and I are dressed up in Christ, we can't use swear words. When we're dressed up in Christ, you can't tell a lie. When you're dressed up in Christ, you can't sit and gossip. Dressed up in Christ, you cannot be resentful. Lewis goes on to say, you see what is happening. The Christ himself, the Son of God, who is man just like you and God just like his Father, is actually at your side and is already at that moment beginning to turn your pretense into reality. This is not merely a fancy way of saying that you, your conscience is telling you what to do. If you simply ask your conscience, you get one result. If you remember that you are dressing up as Christ, you get a different result. <clears throat> there are lots of things which your conscience might not call definitely wrong, especially things in your mind, but which you will see at once you cannot go on doing if you are seriously trying to be like Christ. For you are no longer thinking simply about right and wrong. You are trying to catch the good infection from a person. It's more like painting a portrait than like obeying a set of rules. And the odd thing is that while in one way it's much harder than keeping rules, in another way it's far easier. The real Son of God is at your side. He's beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself. He's beginning, so to speak, to inject this kind of, his kind of life and thought. He's Zoe, that means life, into you. Being, uh, beginning to turn the tin soldier into a live man. He talks a lot about tin soldiers because he, he played with little tin soldiers when he was a boy. But then he talks about tin soldiers being turned into real human beings. And that's what God does for us. The part of you that does not like it is still part of that tin soldier. And brothers and sisters, that is really what John 15 is all about, isn't it? I am the true vine, Jesus said. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. In other words, you have been justified. But then he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Lewis ends his chapter like this. I've been talking as if it were we who did everything. In reality, of course, it is God who does everything. We at most allow it to be done to us. In a sense, you might even say it is God who does the pretending. The three personal God, so to speak, sees before him, in fact, a self-centered, greedy, grumbling, rebellious human animal. But he says, let us pretend that this is not a mere creature, but our son. It, this creature, is like Christ insofar as it is a human, for he became man. Let us pretend that it is also like him in spirit. Let us treat it as if it were what in fact it is not. Let us pretend in order to make the pretense into a reality. God looks at you as if you were a little Christ. And Christ stands beside you to change you into his likeness. I dare say this idea of divine make-believe sounds rather strange at first. But is it so strange, really? Is it not how the higher thing always raises the lower? A mother teaches her baby to talk by talking to it as if it understood long before it really does. We treat our dogs as if they were almost human. And that's why they really become almost human in the end. You know, I believe Lewis is right about this. But I want to expand on what he wrote. As you and I dress up in Christ, we become friends with the Father, for he pretends that we are indeed Christ. As you and I dress up in Christ, we fall in love with Jesus. Do you know who Bruce Marciano is? You do? You don't? Somebody does. <clears throat> How many of you have seen the, the Bible movie that was made called Matthew? Some of you have. I don't recommend Hollywood Bible movies, usually, because they distort the Bible, they distort the truth, but I can re recommend two series. The one is this Matthew movie where they used only the words of the Bible. It was the Newton International Version of words they used. I can recommend that one. At first, you may feel uncomfortable as you watch it because Marciano portrays Jesus as a very cheerful person. But as you keep on, it will change your perception of Jesus somewhat. The other series that I can recommend is the series where it has the story of Joseph, Abram, Joseph, Jacob. Those are the three. Then it goes on to David. It wasn't as good. But Joseph especially. <clears throat> Bruce Marciano. He played the role of Jesus. In this movie, he had to speak only the words of Jesus. He had to dress only like Jesus would have dressed. He had to express only the emotions that Jesus would have expressed, at least as he understood it. He had to display only the attitudes of Jesus. He wrote the book, In the Footsteps of Jesus. And in that book, Bruce Marciano describes his emotional feelings, the impact that it had on him when he tried to be Jesus. It's a rather moving book to read. 
foot, in the footsteps of Jesus. It describes how the movie was made. There were times that they had to stop all the cameras because Bruce would burst out crying and he couldn't go on because of his empathy with Jesus. When it came to the crucifixion scenes, he writes that again they had to do it over and over and over because not only he, but the crew, the camera people, all the helpers were weeping. It had such an impact on them. Bruce was never the same again. He started out as a film star, but as he dressed up as Jesus, he fell in love with Jesus. Today, he's a friend of Jesus and an ambassador for the God who, and who conducted that, that movie, he believes. And he conducts revival meetings for the God that he loves. Oh, my brothers and sisters, may God give that you and I will have a similar experience as we dress up in Jesus from this day forward. For that's the only way to dress up as Jesus, to put on Christ, is the only way that unjust stewards such as you and I can make friends for ourselves who will receive us into an everlasting home. It's my sincere prayer that we will love Jesus so much that we will become like him. That we will want to be clothed in his robe of righteousness, dressed up in his purity and his love and his goodness, and people will see us as Mr. and Mrs. Miss Dress Up. Not only a friend to children, but a friend of God, the God of the universe. Our closing song is number 114. Number 114, and as we sing it, I want you to Pay attention to these words. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in His justice, which is more than liberty. There's a welcome for the sinner, and more graces to, for the good. There's a mercy with the Savior, and there's healing in His blood. And this verse 3 I love, for the love of God is broader than the measure of man's mind. And the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. Let's sing it as a, as a true prayer. The prayer of our hearts. 114. Let's stand. Thank you.
Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful, broad, deep, eternal love. We thank you for our Savior Jesus, and thank you, Lord, that we can be clothed in his righteousness. We pray that you'll help us, that every day of our lives, from this day on, we will dress up in Jesus, become like Jesus, act like Jesus, Love like Jesus is my prayer in his name. Amen.